it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to join us today for um, a really exciting day. Um, for those of you who've um, attended the festival in the past, you may remember it's a real celebration of creative materials across film, photo, apps and gaming and all sorts of creative approaches to um, tropical diseases. And uh, this year we really wanted to take a step back and take stock of some of the big movements and the big developments that have happened over the last two years, uh, really shaping the conversations the relationships and also the dynamics in science communication, as well as in um, public engagement, community engagement, reaching out to those um, all important communities at risk and affected persons. So we've got a packed day around trying to unpack all of these themes today. Um, first and foremost, we'll be really delving a little bit deeper in uh, the many dimensions and what we really mean by inclusive science communication. We'll be looking at some fantastic examples building on that of public engagement, citizen science, but also capturing community voices um, to, to really affect and affect um, this science communication. And finally, I'm looking forward at four o'clock in the afternoon to bringing my cup of tea and relaxing and enjoying mm -hmm. to hear about wonderful books on health and on disease that have been written in the past year. So please do join us at the end of the day for our book panel. Without any further delay, however, I'd, uh, I'm very excited to jump straight into the first panel. Uh, this is how we wanted to set the scene for the festival this year. And session one is going to be looking at uh, what is needed towards to, re to move towards inclusive science communication, and rethinking images with global movement. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome today our speakers who are on screen here with me. And uh, firstly, a warm welcome to you, Dr. Elizabeth Rassikoala. Thank you. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good to be Hi, here. Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining us. You are president at African Gong, the Pan-African network for the popularization of science and technology and science communication. Thank you for being here. I'd also like to welcome Claire Jantet. Hi, Claire. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, Marianne. Bonjour. Um, you are MSF NOMA campaign manager. Um, and you're also a filmmaker with Inedis. And in the past, we've had the pleasure of um, screening and watching your beautiful documentary, Restoring Dignity, focusing on those affected by NOMA. And we'll be hearing more from you later on about how you capture these stories and also the importance of images in your work. Um, I also like to welcome Widya Prasetyanti. Hello, Widya. Thank you for tuning in. Hi. Hi, Marian. Hi, everyone. I'm Widya. Hi, Widya. Nice to meet you. And nice to meet you too. And you're representing today NLR Indonesia, your program development and quality manager. And you'll be talking to us a little bit more from the perspective of leprosy and disability inclusion. Uh, we also were expecting as part of our panel Chidi Abere Ibe. Uh, Chidi Abere is a medical student, but also now a medical illustrator. And uh, it's quite rare for us to talk about something viral in a good sense in these meetings, but uh, <laughs> it has gone viral uh, with rather simple but striking um, images of mm. black people. Um, so we'll be hearing from Chidi Abere. Although he's on, uh, not able to join us right now, we were able to catch up. Uh, late last night, and I've got an interview of his incredible work to share with you a bit later on. But without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth now. Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you for opening our day. It's a huge honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Last time we spoke, I was immediately covered with goosebumps and I was nearly in tears. You're an amazing person. You are so passionate about what you do. So it's my uh, pleasure to hand over to you and to all who have tuned in, 
Thank you for joining us and welcome. I hope you'll have a wonderful meeting. Thank you very much, Marianne. And uh, thank you all for welcoming me to yet a new community that I'm engaging with uh, as a network for the first time. I have engaged, uh, and African Gong does engage with um, practitioners in uh, neglected tropical diseases in certain research centers uh, on the continent. But this is my first time uh, engaging with this field as a, as a network. So this is a new family that I feel that I have joined and I'm very excited uh, to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity to contribute and to support and advance the issues that uh, your network is trying to address, which as you so rightly say, sit very much at the heart of what inclusive science communication should be about. Um, hence my title that inclusive science communication and neglected tropical diseases. And we're looking here at bridging the global north-south divide through equitable research, knowledge brokerage and transformative health outcomes. So let's actually start by interrogating uh, the very phrase inclusive science communication. Because if we're not careful, unfortunately, there's always a downside to these things when they become a, a movement. We, we could end up with them simply becoming buzzwords, as we, as we know, unfortunately, with all the inclusion parameters. Uh, these could fall into the danger of becoming buzzwords in the global north. And therefore, it is crucial at this juncture for us to note that these issues, while they might be buzzing now in the global north, have been advocated for by practitioners in the global south and organizations such as African Gong over many, many pre preceding decades. We have been banging on about inclusive science communication long before they become a buzz in the global north. And African Gong has provided leadership, action, and dynamic interactions across the global North and South regions of the world as a direct means of transforming and enriching the discourses and perspectives of the science communication field through engendering paradigm shifting understandings of what inclusion and equity within the field should be from the pivotal perspectives of the very groups that are marginalized and made invisible within it. It is very important that we give ownership and drive to the inclusive science communication agenda to the very people that are marginalized by it. It is not enough for those who are already empowered to be given the wholesale mandate of defining what inclusive science communication is. And if we're not careful, that is how we end up in the danger zone of these sentiments becoming buzzwords. So it's very important to put that marker down that we need to be on our guard. This is not the time for complacency at all. This is the time to be very, very careful so a particularly illuminating insight that should be brought to bear on the discourse of inclusive science communication and neglected tropical diseases is premised on what we now understand to be the very direct and insidious link. Some would call it an umbilical cord that profoundly links the colonial nature of scientific research and the colonial nature of science communication in the global south regions of the world. And the neglected tropical disease research arena is one of the fields that has been most perniciously impacted by this insidious link to the detriment of much of the global south regions of the world that are most affected by these diseases. What this describes and articulates are the mechanisms of inequitable North-South research partnerships based on hegemonic Global North funding frameworks, which dominate the research agendas 
and policy frameworks in global South regions. These neo-colonial research transnational partnerships described by some uh, uh, more subtly as helicopter research end up creating an underlying pressure on practitioners in the global South regions to communicate science through approaches and delivery practices that mimic those of their northern counterparts in yet another guise of the internationalization of global scientific research and science communication. Thus, the stage is set for an insidious perpetuation of Eurocentricism. The unequal power dynamics at play here are well illustrated by this quote from Carbonier in 2014. The very notion of North-South partnerships has turned into yet another development buzzword. Virtually everyone seems to agree with it in principle, but actual practice shows that implementing equitable partnerships is difficult. Money flows tend to determine decision-making and actual division of labor. These inequitable research and Eurocentric dominant science communication practices in the global south open up a critical and timely conversation that makes the case for the coupling of the decolonization of scientific research and science communication agendas in order for practitioners in the global south to inclusively and empowering, empoweringly foreground their local challenges, their contexts, opportunities, and strengths, and thus transform the developmental opportunities and benefits of scientific endeavor and its communication for the socioeconomic and health well being of their local populations. What this means in practice is that inclusive science communication needs the paradigm shift of transforming its knowledge brokering role into one which objectively interfaces between science and society. In effect, what this means is that science communicators should engage with the public in dynamics which challenge science and also science communications presumed universality, objectivity, and positivism, and deliver advocacy which holds up a mirror of accountability to science in delivering on its much vaunted promises of science for all. Are we really in a world of science for all? Are we really in a world of science for the common good to all in society? This also includes foregrounding the ethics and values that should drive scientific advancement and which beg the question, are the benefits of the scientific enterprise shared equally for all across the globe? Because if that were the case, we would not be here talking about a group of diseases that affect people uh, um, predominantly in the global south that we are now terming neglected tropical diseases. That in itself is, is a, it gives the, the evidence to the case that we are not living in a world of science for all. And what is the role of policymakers in this realm of inequality in North-South research funding agendas and science communication practices. What should be the role of policymakers in the global south? And what is the role of global health governance systems that should drive inclusion and challenge the inequities of this north-south divide? So the recommendation here for the bridging of this profound global divide is that of the radical repositioning of science communication, shifting the center of its interests from the brokerage of scientific knowledge itself towards addressing the complex social problems that demand collectively produced knowledge, dialogue, and social action from the social actors involved 
and directly impacted by the problems in which they are immersed. It is then critical for us to question how and why we are still in 2022 dealing with diseases that affect a certain part of the world and are termed neglected tropical diseases in a world where within a year of COVID, we're able to be able to develop global vaccines um, that yet again, as, 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 as some have mentioned, have not been shared equitably. So the, 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 the evidence base of this profound global north-south divide in scientific research and science communication where neglected tropical diseases sits has, if anything else, been very profoundly uh, uh, spotlighted by the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the response, the dynamism of the response to it, the speed and the level of resource allocation, the level of research that has been put into the COVID-19 pandemic. And it begs the question, if neglected tropical diseases, let's just imagine we change the nomenclature. Could we ever sit and talk about neglected European diseases? Are there any neglected European diseases? Are there any neglected American diseases? Why is the T in that acronym, tropical, why is the T so critical? And why does the T make the N, neglected, seem inevitable? And that's the paradigm shift that we really need to bring to the table in terms of those north-south inequalities that absolutely undermine the efforts of practitioners in the global south to drive research, to drive resources, to drive uh, 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 um, transformative science communication, to enable us to be able to transition to a stage where these diseases are not only eradicated, but they become uh, uh, um, uh, something that we discuss in the past tense. And it is only within this transformed realm that we can engender the transition of research on and communication of neglected tropical diseases from the peripheries and margins. They really are on the margin and the peripheries of the global health systems, of policy systems, of research, of resource systems. How do we move them from the periphery and the margin? How do we move them center stage? That really is the challenge. That's the transform realm where they need to move. How do we take them to the center stage of global health disparities where these disparities are discussed and addressed? How do we drive them to the center stage of global health governance? oversight and policy making and finally how do we then drive the eradication treatment and enhance the life chances the livelihoods and the quality of life of the survivors in these regions that are most impacted by these neglected tropical diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. You've given us much food for thought uh, right from the start of your talk, of your address, but also right from the start of this day. And this is what we want to really keep in mind, uh, all those pra very practical points that you've given us um, what to think about and what is the future for making real inclusive science communication and as you say not just buzzwords so thank you so much for that um 
We're going to build on what you have just been telling us about, and um, I'm going to hand over to some of the work by Chidi Abere. Um, for those of you, I'm sure many of you have seen it, but for those who don't, uh, just up towards the end of last year, Chidi Abere's images um, just really took the internet and social media by storm. Uh, he's since kind of been mobbed by the global media as well, and um, I'm not going to say too much because he's the, the best person to explain what happened, how it happened. Chidia Berry's journey is really fascinating from that of a medical student, he's only 25, um, to becoming this kind of global sensation. So I'm just going to play an interview. We were able to record G. Unfortunately, uh, he can't be with us live unless his flight is delayed, in which case he said he will jump into the panel discussion later. So over to Chidi Averi. I'm Chidi Averi Ibe. I'm um, an Andrea medical illustrator and the first medical student at the Kiev Medical University of Ukraine. I, I did a first degree also in chemistry at the University of Ukraine, Nigeria. I also serve as, uh, as, uh, as a chief medical illustrator, journal of global neurosurgery, and also medical illustrator at the International Center of Genetic Diseases at the Harvard Medical School. I, I hold a couple of positions globally, um, several organizations and um, institutions around the world. And uh, it's, it's good to be here today. All right, for me, um, I started making officials in 2020 during the lockdown. But before then, I was already an artist. I focused on drawing African children with pen and pencil and um, telling the story of Africa. But I, I, I doubled into art into illustrations in 2020 by the guidance of my mentor, Dr. Oryx Sydney. And um, that being that there, were, there was little um, tutorials on the internet, there was no, uh, there are basically no teaching aids that, 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 that guide to one in medical illustration. So I had to basically teach myself these illustrations. I had to teach myself and not something I had to teach myself the, the software that I use in creating these illustrations. In that journey of creating these illustrations, I realized that there was no representation or there was little representation in our medical textbook in our public health resources in, you know, over the internet there, there there were no proper representation of images and it became a problem for me because as a self illustrator I, I needed these images to have used as references in in, in in you know in growing and in learning but sadly there were no images like that so for me this became something of interest i had to Deliberately, deliberately work towards addressing this. So I, I reached out to my mentor and I said, this is a problem I've realized in this. And I love us to work towards addressing. And he said, yeah, this is a great idea that we could work towards doing that. So I started drawing black people, representing black people. And for me, people ask, what makes you quite different from other illustrators? So I, I, I say this a lot. In as much as I'm passionate about representing black people, I, in, in my journey, I, I try to tell stories in my images. I try to portray how Africa looks like typically. I try to tell the African story because I understand that's what makes these images quite relatable. So that has really been my journey in illustrations and, um, and going from there and constantly working towards addressing the healthcare disparities through my images. Well, I would say that I did not expect it sincerely. I mean, for me, I, I didn't actually know people can get famous for creating illustrations, right? Because I was just, I'm just one year and some months in illustrations, but there are persons who have been drawing for 30 years, for a whole, uh, for a donkey number of years, right? But I mean, but there was, they haven't really been famous, I would say. So, I mean, I, I didn't know people could get famous for creating images like that. So when I became famous, I was like, what's, what's happening? You know, I, I, I mean, it took me by, by surprise, I would say. But I, I'm totally grateful for everything that happened in my life at this point. I'm totally humble about everything. But I would say the reaction generally was overwhelming. I mean, keeping up with the press, keeping up with interviews, with the social media, 
I think at some point I felt sick, you know, because I, I tried to manage the whole, um, the whole, um, uh, what I would say, the whole media and the cameras and all of that. But I would say it was a moment in my life that I had to sit back and and be grateful for everything, for the journey, for the hard work I had put, and and that got me to this point. So I would say generally I'm, I was I was surprised, and I and, and I'm grateful for everything. Yeah, so um, I, I would say there are some in, integral areas to be very mindful of. Um, for example, um, I mean this. I mean for the area of tropical diseases, this is this is most an area in the public health, and uh, it's it's also amazing to also know that um, that for those who are in the community sector, for those who do advocacy, for example, for cases like malaria, for example, you know. I mean, you you're going to a community of people, you know, of local local women or, or children, or I mean, first of all, who barely do not understand proper English, who barely do not understand, who are who are who haven't had formal education, right? Then you're going to make an advocacy or making make an awareness of safety in particular tropical disease or particular you know um, infectious disease in that community. It also means that that, that the resources that I use for advocacy. Are are not diverse, you know. For example, you I mean here in Africa in Nigeria, material that I use for advocacy, most cases are all on white illustrations. I mean, there is so much of a communication gap. I mean, got research has also shown that people um, people uh, people have this fear for things when there is sense of foreignness in there, right? People don't really relate to things when there is when they feel a sense of foreignness. You know, and that actually relates to how I tell stories, which you earlier out, right? Because, for example, I I I quit I quit a joint of a child having measles, and that's this image just had a child having measles and still riding a bicycle, going to the farm to you know to to cultivate what they would, I mean, what they eat for the day or for the dinner. I mean, that that's that's a typical story of how Africa looks like generally, right? Because People, people have less concern of how um, Africa looks like, of, of, of how these children or how, how the community are being taken care of, right? Because if our healthcare system is working towards providing an equitable healthcare system or a, a healthcare that is accessible, right, there must be a key consideration of the community that are marginalized, right? The community that, that, that do not have access to this healthcare system, right? So this is where, um, where leaders, I would say, for the legislators, the, the, the policy makers, right, would say that um, for us, right, our goal right now is to see how we can bridge the communication gap between the healthcare providers and the community. And that is a way of creating resources that are very relatable, right? And, and, and having people from the community being part of the, the, the policy makers, right? Because if they see them, if they see themselves among the leaders who are making who are making decisions, they would find a need to adhere, I would say, to 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 pay keen attention to to uh, to the caution that I give them. So typically, um, what the policy makers or what um, uh, leaders or, or, or what uh, people in general is that. We need to be able to bridge that gap because there is so much gap, and that's what this singular image will have been able to create to bridge that gap, and that's the gap of communication. So that is what um, policymakers should always have at the back of their mind that there is a gap that must be filled, and for for that to be filled, we need to find the right tool in filling that gap, which should have just to be um, a, a keen interest on representation. A keen interest on inclusivity and understanding the needs of a particular community at the right time, you know, at the right moment. So I, I think this is actually the major, you know, in in, in addressing an, an issues like this. Well, I I would say that um, I mean it took a long time, a long long time, and. Um, First of all, I would like to say that I'm excited, right, that a change is already happening because shortly after my image went viral, I've seen a lot of black images online, right? I've seen a lot of black images coming out and I'm excited about that. 
But why this image took a long time um, before surfacing was because there was a very little number of people who were passionate about representation. You know, a lot of people were there advocating for diversity, advocating for inclusivity, but there was very little number of people who were keen on proper representation, you know, which is, which for me, is a bedrock to diversity and the bedrock to inclusivity because we cannot we cannot be diverse without having proper representation. So I would say that's because people had not find it very important. People didn't um, understand the need of representation, and there was a very little number of people who were working through who who were actually working as seriously in in the issue of representation. For example, there are a lot of images. There are a lot of black images of a black lives online i mean there are, there are a few i would say i mean for from research which shows that just about 4.5 percent of images in general medical textbook have black people so this simply means that there are there's a little number of other artists or illustrators who are drawing this right and that's why because because there is a little ecosystem of people who are drawing these images right that's why these images hadn't really come to limelight and people had not really thought about it you know people has people were just um, used to seeing the white illustration people were just used to seeing um the uh, what i say used to seeing the superficial representation which is the which is the corrugation scheme right and that's why this image when this image went viral people now said oh for 50 years in the healthcare sector i have never seen an image of such in my entire life it's amazing to know that's because from generation to generation the images that have been passed to people were all white illustrations. So that built a, that that built a consciousness in them that they had no um, they had no reason to question the bias or to question the norm. So I would say these are these are factors that have affected why these images or why this um, this thing has been why this um, why the image or representation has not really been a topic that people have really talked about. But I'm also as I said I'm excited that it's it's, it's, a, it's, it's a topic that is actually ongoing right now people are seeing the need of representation people are actually advocating for it and i'm excited about it okay so um i think that's um, two questions in one so i'm going to start with myself typically so for me um the, the idea towards nominalize or, 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 or um, normalizing the use of black images or normalizing how well we see black images or or representation is to create a system where we have passionate people who are interested in doing visuals like this right as i Ella said this has been a problem and the only way to solve the problem is to finding a solution around the problem right so because there was a small number of illustrators who were actually passionate about creating images like this right the, the way to solve that is to create a system where, where uh, we have black people or Africans also who are skilled, who are talented, and who are also willing to create images like this. For me, this is how we can, this is how I can normalize and, and how, how, how I can see in the near future, oh, that if I Google some skin conditions, I would see black images, right? Yeah, so um, for me, that's one, one of my goals is to start an initiative way we train um, young Africans who are passionate about this. And once we've trained them, we we'll put them in, in, in a, 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 what I say, in, in an ecosystem or in, in an organization, which I want to start an organization, which is called the Association of, the, the Association of African Medical Illustrators. For me, this is also a way of, you know, uh, as I said, normalizing these images to training young people who can do the same thing. And I mean, looking forward globally and seeing other people join the train. My my goal or my my, my plan generally is that once I flip a medical textbook in the near future, I would see a lot of black images, right? Because most images that most most um most points or times where black images were used were were were, were points where um particular uh. Uh, images was related to etc. transmitted infection. So uh, I mean, for me, typically, I also want to see how we can address how we can address that bias, you know, through proper representation in our textbook, 
in the public health resources over the internet. And my second would be that once I Google a skin condition like psoriasis or any skin condition, that I would see images of black people which are which are represented. I mean, there's been, there's been a lot of cases where a patient was misdiagnosed because the doctor, I mean, had no prior experience on on dealing with some skin conditions that are on black on black, black skin, right? So for me, I I want to see how um, in the next future that we have black images on skin conditions focused strictly on dermatology. And, and and see how we can improve our healthcare outcome through proper representation, through showing of diverse diverse images, and through fighting the racial injustice that we see through these images. And and I said this a lot in all my talks that this is this is a, um this is a work of this is a community work, right? This is what everybody has to come together, you know, in, in addressing. And for me, that would that would be my my excitement seeing this in the future that we'll be able to achieve this, you know, as a community. So that's what I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, what I'm also looking forward to doing. And also one of my biggest um, goals also to create a library that has to do with um, people of color, where we can see images like this, right? On the internet, it is gonna, it's gonna be a, a library, more, more, more of a catalog where other artists have the ability to contribute their own images, you know, in, 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 in normalizing, um, the use of black images or or the people of color or, or the images that are not that are not, that are not white. Yeah. Wow, some fascinating, really groundbreaking work there. Um, thank you, Chidia Bere, if you're listening to us. Uh, somewhere for this and a uh, really very powerful <clears throat> uh, testimony about what images can do. So not just for in terms of the advocacy that Elizabeth um, told kind of set the scene with really thinking about um, this north south relationship and also within research and within health and public health and medicine, but also just more generally about uh, engaging a whole generation of illustrators and even all the way down to avoiding something as awful as a misdiagnosis uh, due to the lack of representation in images. So that was incredible. And, uh, you know, watch this space, um, a very ambitious and energetic young man. So I'm sure we'll be seeing a lot more um, from Chidi Abere soon. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to Claire Gentet. Claire, hello, welcome. We're old friends and um, perhaps uh, some of our audience have already seen you at the festival, but also at uh, some of the many NOMA events and conferences that uh, have been organized over the couple year, last couple of years. Um, it's been an amazing journey for this incredibly neglected disease, thanks to advocates like yourself, um, the energy of Médecins Sans Frontières and, of course, the countless partners and, most importantly, the biggest advocates, which are the survivors and the affected persons themselves. Uh, Claire, I'll hand over to you. Um, we can't wait to hear from you, a filmmaker, about how the power of images, um, but also the fine balance that you're able to achieve um, is really, really important for science communication, for disease awareness, and for advocacy um, in, in this field. So Claire, over to you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Marianne, uh, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And indeed, it has been uh, a strong collaboration uh, with you, uh, Cameron and, and Marianne, for, for already two years. Um, and uh, we are very happy that we can continue together to raise awareness on NOMA. Uh, I, I'm not so sure how many among you know uh, what NOMA is. And, and this is a question I like to start with because this is part of, of the visual challenge also that we have been facing, uh, Fabrice and I, as, as documentary filmmakers and photographers, when we started working on this topic uh, five years ago. 
Um, I, I today also, and I should mention it, uh, collaborate with NSF uh, as their NOMA campaign manager. And like many people in, in the NOMA community and, and allies, uh, we, we have the, the common goal of getting NOMA included in the uh, NTD list. And, and we believe uh, that this is where the, the disease can sit to get more attention and, and resources. Um, so as I said, and I will start with this, I mean, I had no idea what was uh, NOMA when I first heard about it. And uh, I remember, Marianne, you started uh, a conference by saying that when you Google NOMA, um, it, it's not easy as well to, to, to understand what is it. Uh, you will see things about a restaurant uh, in Copenhagen. And then uh, if you dig enough, you, you will see really terrible images. And so, I mean, from our perspective of uh, visual artists, uh, what we thought is that it was maybe one reason why people don't know about NOMA, um, that there is this lack of visual evidence uh, of, of what the disease is, uh, but also the nature of the disease itself uh, being very terrible and, and creating terrible damages on the face of, of survivors that prevent people from looking at them. Um, I would just say a few words to, to explain what is NOMA. This is, this is a, an infection um, and, and in a few weeks, um, um, the disease affects the face of, of patients and, and many of them will die. Um, it's estimated that 90 percent of them uh, will die and, and survivors um, are, are disfigured. So um, tissues are, are lost and, and uh, they will suffer uh, from pain and discomfort, um, having trouble to eat, speak, breathe, etc. Um, so I'm coming now to, to our experience um, in, in Northwest Nigeria because this is where we filmed uh, and photographed uh, people affected uh, by NOMA. Um, I have to say that it was uh, a quite difficult uh, journey. Um, and and um, even doctors uh, we met there uh, told us that this is among the most terrible disease that they have ever seen. Um, and, and so we try to find solutions on how oh, we can look at this disease, but also amplify the voice of people affected. And we thought that indeed uh, making sure that we look at people, not only, I mean, from the perspective of, of, uh, of patients, but also for other things that they are doing in their life, who they are, uh, their personality, uh, their job, their passion, etc., could be an interesting way to, to, to speak about the disease and, and create a link with the audience, uh, because ultimately this is what it is about, uh, that we wanted people to, to get interest and, and uh, really don't walk away from the disease. Um, and and um, yeah. So more attention is, is given to this issue. Uh, so we tried in, to change the narrative and, and very soon, I mean, a, a creative uh, process uh, started and, and it involves a uh, survivor of the disease itself. As I was mentioning, uh, most of the people would die uh, in just a few weeks, uh, but uh, there are very few rare survivors and they are the ones who were treated in Sokoto and that we met in Northwest Nigeria. Uh, Marianne, maybe if you can if you can put on the screen uh, this image that I shared with you. It, it's an image of a patient, and it's quite uh, special for us. This image. Um, her name is is Balkisu, uh, and and she's holding a picture that we had taken one year before. So so it tells you a bit, and I wanted to share this picture with you because it tells you a bit about the process. Uh, that, that we, um, the, the way we walked uh, in Sokoto. So, so we really wanted people to, to understand what we were doing, to be associated with, with our, our, our way of, of showing the disease and trying to raise awareness. 
So we explained to them, we were printing pictures, uh, sharing, the, uh, sharing the pictures with them. Uh, and, and every time we were coming back, uh, making sure that they were still comfortable uh, about sharing their story, etc. Um, this picture of Balkisu, it's, it's quite interesting because the pictures that she's holding was taken a year uh, before. And as you can see, she was very skinny when, when she arrived at the hospital at first. Uh, this picture was taken before she was uh, selected for surgery. And, and the picture, um, the actual picture, uh, you can see that she, she has gained weight and, and she has uh, been through facial reconstruction. And, and she was very, very happy that day because we had this picture selected in, in a festival in the south of France. And uh, she, she was so happy to know that people have been hearing her story and, and uh, uh, were aware of what happened to her. And this is something, I mean, it's not easy uh, as of today to, to communicate uh, with, uh, with patients because most of them would be very isolated. Uh, living in villages, they do not have like cell phones, etc. But every time we can, we we try to to send some news uh, of of where the picture or or, or shown or, or when when the film, the documentaries that we made uh, are screened somewhere, and and we make sure that in a way or another, um, um, patients, their families, and and the staff at the Sokoto Hospital are aware of of the their stories being heard and seen um, as much as possible. So yeah, indeed, we, we, we tried to, to create a connection with them. And, and this was a way also to, to, to make the disease known. So we had more and more um, publication with those pictures. I guess now, I mean, we are a bit uh, further in the process and we have seen uh, that step by step, uh, people got more interest uh, thanks to this campaign and, and um, of course, uh, MSF work, but also ESNTD work and, and everyone who has been involved uh, until now. Um, maybe at this point, I would like to share with you a short video uh, recorded uh, by my colleague Chloe Fournier. Uh, we have been working together on uh, the um, visuals, uh, and, and she, she, she has been drawing uh, many portraits of, of uh, Noma survivors uh, to explain also and, and be able to share knowledge. Um, so this uh, can, can also give you another perspective on the way we have been trying to center the people affected and and uh, communicate um, about Noma. Um, Marianne, if you if you can start the video, please. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. I'm Claire Fournier, a visual artist based in France. I can't be here with you today, but I wanted to share a short message about my work on Noma and the challenges faced during the creative phase of this project. I started working on this topic by creating a series of portraits based on photos taken by Inedis in Nigeria during the filming of their documentary, Restoring Dignity. Then I worked on the MSF website dedicated to Noma to create infographics and drawings explaining what the disease is, its cause and consequences, its symptoms, or how the infection spreads. I created on purpose simple drawings with plain colors to help viewers understand quickly important facts. The second part of this work was more challenging because there are very few clinical pictures available. We wanted to represent the different stages of NOMA with drawings to fill this gap. We had a lot of discussions with Claire and I looked into material like the classification of Motondo, the one by Dr. Cario, the stages described by the World Health Organization in the information brochure published in 2016. I also collected a lot of pictures. To keep it light, 
I opted for a line drawing telling the story of people affected with sensitivity. These drawings are realistic, but in refined style that speaks of the human in all its diversity. Diversity of gender, age, and origin. The objective was to show that NOMA doesn't affect only people in specific regions. Indeed, cases have been reported all over the world, even if there is a lack of visual evidence. For each type of NOMA, I drew a healthy face and then I headed a wound evolving image after image until the last stage. So I pr produced six drawings for each type of NOMA. First, the healthy face, then a close-up of the gingivitis, the edema, the gangrene, the scaring stage, and finally, the sequelae stage. I also had to think a lot about the use of color. To highlight the ones, I decided to use a color code for each stage of the disease. It starts from the bright red of the gingivitis, when the disease can still be treated, to the black color for the gangrene stage. At this point, tissues are dead and 19% of people affected are estimated to die. The high mortality of NOMA and the terrible consequences for survivors are the reasons why we needed to act and share knowledge. I would like to thank Claire, Inedis, and MSF for their collaborations and the ideas raised during our discussions. By showing the extent of the damages caused by NOMA, I hope my drawings play a didactic role to raise awareness. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you very much, Marianne, for, for sharing this video. Um, and, and so just to conclude, because um, of course I, I'm really passionate about this topic and I can speak for hours about it, but I will leave some place for the discussion um, and, and really feel free to, to ask any question. Um, I just wanted to say that we have been trying to fill this uh, gap um, of of, um, of uh, Noma not being represented or, or not having uh, a place in, in the media and that we can see today um, that there is a, a, a shift and this is really a, a, a great time and, and we hope that this is just the beginning of, of Noma being more known uh, and, and therefore treated because um, also reflecting on what was said before um it's it's key uh to to raise awareness because this is what can allow treatment to be given on time thank you very much and looking forward to discuss with you later thank you claire and uh thank you chloe as well uh you both put so much thought um in your creative processes um and it's really wonderful to see colleagues such as yourselves, Chidi Abere, Elizabeth, really drawing on your skills um, in either your approaches to tackling these issues or just quite simply in a creative skill such as drawing or illustration and really to take that immediately into some extremely powerful voices for advocacy for these neglected diseases, neglected communities. So uh, it's amazing. And thank you so much for sharing this. I've put a link to the shorter version of your film, Surviving Noma. It's available on YouTube in many languages. So for anyone who would like to uh, find out more in a very beautiful and dignified manner, please do jump over to YouTube after this uh, discussion and, and uh, watch Claire's film. So thank you for that. And so to round off our discussion this morning, 
uh, we couldn't talk about uh, inclusive science communication and we couldn't talk about equity if we didn't focus really a bit more specifically, quite specifically, on disability inclusion. And so um, it was really important for us to include um, colleagues from this uh, sphere. And therefore, at this point, I'd like to welcome very warmly uh, our next speaker, Widya Prasetyanti. Widya, you're from the NLR Indonesia, uh, until no leprosy remains, tuning in from Jakarta. And I'll hand over to you now to share a few thoughts about how we can improve equity and inclusion for those affected with disabilities. Thank you, Widya. Yes, uh, thank you, Marian. And uh, uh, good morning. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, or even good uh, evening. And uh, I'm Vidya, and uh, my pleasure. It is my pleasure to uh, to involve on this uh, forum. And uh, yes, um, uh, I learned uh, a lot from uh, previous panelists, and and uh, one of the important here is uh, I capture what what it's uh, uh, science communication. It is uh, about bridging and transforming and and informing uh, or even raise awareness uh, about um, uh, uh, this um, uh, help information uh, to the uh, more wider uh, communities uh, or uh, non-scientist um, uh, um, uh, audiences. And um, um, I understand that, uh, I think we, we all understand that also uh, disability inclusion in, in, in the science is, is what, what why we say it is crucial because uh, you know uh, a person with uh, disabilities and uh, a person acted, affected by leprosy in this case uh, we are nlr working specifically on the on this topic um uh, we face uh, more a uh, stigma uh, uh, discrimination and and those uh, inadequate uh, policy and programs and and that's that's what uh, happened in in a uh, in a situation with person affected by leprosy, and person with disabilities, and this is this is why uh, it is very important uh, for uh, disability inclusion in science and in in this case in especially in in health, and also in in the discussion uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, what the, the world of STEM, uh, uh, science, uh, technology, and engineer and mathematics. Uh, uh, it's it's the field uh, uh, for uh, the space for person affected by leprosy or person with disabilities. This is in in the in the uh, wider uh, um, uh, uh, in, in a general uh, discussion on disability inclusion, uh, this is very rare uh, opportunity for for um, a person with disabilities scientists or or scientists with, with disabilities uh, to be part or, or or have space on on this uh, uh, STEM field, and uh, of course also the barriers uh, in terms of access or knowledge, resources, and even involve. Uh, on the research uh, are are very uh, rare uh, still in in this world, so uh, that's why uh, in this uh, situation I I open why uh, disability inclusion is in in science is very important, very crucial, and the same also with the disability inclusion in uh, communication uh, is very also it's very needed uh, because uh, you know. Um, uh, people, uh, uh, many, many uh, cases happened, uh, especially in public, uh, that there are, there are so many uh, wrong messages there out there. And, um, and uh, whether the languages, uh, whether the terminology, whether the images, uh, the point of view, uh, looking on, on a person with disabilities, person with, dis with affected by leprosy as, as, as the object not as a subject who telling what what the truth what is happened to them so uh, in this situation uh, uh, it is very important to see from the perspective of person with disabilities or perspective of disability themselves 
to to how we we need to change or to rethinking about about uh, uh, communication and uh, disability co inclusive communication is uh, uh, will help to to fulfill uh, the, what we call uh, leaving no behind um, as a key component for for. Uh, 2030 SDGs uh, agenda. So uh, in this case, like like so many uh, uh, nowadays, there are many many um, uh, guidelines uh, UN disability inclusion on on uh, disability inclusive on commu communication, and then also um, the ID guidelines uh, by uh, ZBM, for example. They have very very good uh, guidelines uh, on how. Uh, uh, to to come to to use uh, uh, or to to mainstream disability inclusive on communication or what uh, and 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 so many uh, um, uh, other guidelines on that. Um, why we talk about disability in this situation because disability is, is has a large uh, population. If we know uh, it's about fifteen percent of of. Uh, um, <clears throat> population in the world, uh, they are uh, with disability. They are person with disability, and it can be increased a lot due to diseases. So um, and and also uh, climate change. So uh, disability in in wherever in in every single uh, uh, corner uh, we might meet person with disabilities. Or even in our family or, or ourselves, we, we we can say, I'm not a person with disabilities. But again, when we look at on the situation and on, on, on what what I feel, uh, for example, now I, I said, oh, do I? Uh, maybe maybe last time or, or or yesterday I didn't feel anything that I have disability, but. Suddenly, when I went to doctor and doctor uh, uh, diagnosed me with, with uh, for example, with high uh, uh, blood sugar, um, and then I have risk uh, to become uh, with the, uh, living in with the, with disability. So that's what uh, that's why we we talk uh, why it is important uh, disability inclusion in this uh, um, uh, uh, global uh, movement. And in disability inclusion, um, uh, we use uh, uh, what it's called a twin track approach. It's uh, empowerment and and the, the mainstream on on uh, disability. Why it's important? Eh? In empowerment and and um, uh, uh, mainstreaming on on disability is 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 a twin track. We cannot uh, uh, take one track and and then following with the other track. We we need to go. Uh, uh, to go with those two, uh, these both tracks together. We need to start uh, from zero. We, we start in both uh, tracks. Why empowerment? Because it is important to to look at on, on the specific needed, uh, specific needs of, of a person affected, person with disabilities themselves. While treating uh, individual with, with, uh, uh, with health condition, we also encourage uh, them and family to meet other groups uh, uh, of person uh, affected to empower them uh, to speak up to voice their uh, specific concern uh, especially in time of their condition and and they telling themselves about their condition that's what uh, we we use uh, why we, we we take this uh, approach uh, of, um, in, in uh, what we call empowerment in a group, uh, and uh, they also uh, have to be uh, there in a group of person affected. In our uh, um, approach, a person affected by leprosy, uh, whenever possible, they, they need to join uh, to uh, the, the group of a person affected by leprosy, and even more to join to bigger group in in uh, um, uh, organization of person uh, with disabilities. And further uh, to strengthen to strengthen their voice in, into a larger uh, community um, uh, inclusive uh, groups uh, as is in, in 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 the community. So this is what uh, we 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 
what we mean by empowerment to be active participate on 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 in, in every single uh, um uh, level of of uh, life of person uh, affected in time of mainstreaming the, the other track it is very important to to build the environment uh, the uh, uh, that where um uh, the capacity uh, and and um uh, also uh, the knowledge of of the community, the decision makers, the stakeholders around are, are there to 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 be uh, able for person with disabilities or person affected involved in in in, in different in, in every stores. So um, this is uh, why uh, both approach, uh, both uh, uh, tracks should be uh, come together since in the beginning of of uh, disability uh, inclusion and mainstream uh, uh, disability inclusion uh, um, in in uh, our our uh, communication as well and um, i give uh, 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 one also situation that uh, re uh, learn from what happened in indonesia uh, uh, during pandemic um, the social uh, i know uh, even in in the world we know that uh, social media it's it's really uh, rich uh, youth population uh, like, like more than uh, in indonesia ourselves uh, uh, we reach um, about 60 or 70% of of our population they use social media uh, uh, in, until it's, it's recorded until this this year, the beginning of this year, in January two thousand twenty. It is it is uh, uh, a note that more than um, or almost two hundred million of of people in Indonesia we use uh, social media, and uh, we use YouTube, uh, TikTok, and and and, uh, and Instagram, and and so many uh, we use uh, this uh, social media. And this is this is quite big change uh, when we look at uh, a couple of years ago, uh, um, uh, and and especially because because the connection, internet connection, are quite quite easy to to get in 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 uh, Indonesia, and also because because the needs uh, and also uh, um, uh, the global trend, uh, they use this social media for everything, to get information to campaign uh, or sometimes uh, also uh, uh, to share um, uh, their their feelings and 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 to motivate uh, them or to get or to increase the uh, the empathy of the public that's what social media use and 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 uh, in Indonesia we we uh, 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 we also do the same uh, uh, we have uh, many uh, stories, many, many uh, um, um, activities, also uh, even even uh, done by uh, our um, uh, colleagues with uh, affected by leprosy. They are they are uh, enjoy uh, telling themselves, telling them the, their situation, their their uh, individual experience. They express individual experience. In the meantime, uh, we can see this is what what the the change that uh, by telling the people, uh, uh, it's not only uh, they tell the, their story, their life story, but also uh, this is a way for uh, for what it's called um, kind of awareness uh, that that uh, center to to the the person affected themselves, not by others, so they can be. Uh, the influencer themselves and this is what what uh, we need to see uh, in time of uh, communication again how it is important to involve to to get uh, uh, to have person affected or person with disability themselves to speak up to voicing themselves so this is um, uh, what we use uh, uh, currently in, in in our Indonesia. We we have monthly uh, a talk show. We have we 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 get uh, um, a partnership with with media and 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 also bloggers. That we we have a regular activities with bloggers um, um, uh, to to inform people about about leprosy because. Even in Indonesia, I mean, uh, for because of stigma, uh, uh, previously we use different language. It's called uh, lepra for 
for uh, Kusta. It's uh, it's a uh, ten ten about ten years ago we still use lepra, and then and then uh, 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 gradually it's changed. The language even changed. Uh, the terminology has changed into Kusta. This word it's more powerful regarding to person affected by leprosy themselves. And and uh, even when we have um, our uh, um, uh, government, uh, our new regulation, uh, uh, our our disability uh, law in 2016, uh, uh, it was uh, there the uh, people affected by leprosy, the group of people affected by leprosy, they 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 declare the, themselves as person affected by leprosy and they want to be called as person uh, uh, with kusta, not as person with lepra. So the use of language is very powerful. And, 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 and uh, what the good things uh, uh, in, in with, with uh, this, uh, what the, the good in, in, in that movement, that uh, the group of uh, person with uh, disability uh, with, with affected by leprosy uh, here are also voice uh, uh, their rights uh, together and 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 then as a result uh, our law uh, our uh, national law on uh, uh, regarding uh, about person uh, about the rights of person with disabilities are also include are mentioned uh, clearly uh, uh, it's called kusta there so when when we talk about a person affected by a person with disabilities in Indonesia, it means a person affected by leprosy is also there. So who who's doing that? Not uh, NLR, not uh, other uh, uh, or, or or big organizations, and but they do themselves. This is what what I I uh, what we 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 can see how it's it's important to to provide space to. To open space uh, for them to voicing them, themselves, and in uh, in a communication also uh, uh, to, in 2017 we we tried one uh, uh, method. It's called uh, photo voice, when we 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 ask uh, a person with disabilities and person affected by leprosy to to take the picture, uh, uh, to voice what they're feeling uh, uh, through uh, pictures. And also uh, to give caption on 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 that uh, picture, a lot of fun on the, these activities, and and we use these uh, images, this uh, their voice, in in many event uh, with the government in in advocacy, and so this is what um, uh, I would say. This is very very important, very very uh, very much uh, touching to the the people, uh, rather than. Uh, what uh, um, provide information, giving information in a seminar, in a workshop, sitting for for two hours uh, uh, with with uh, the audience, and so without having person uh, affected themselves, standing there telling themselves it's nothing. So I think this is very what 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 I am telling you. It is important, even this war in this forum, if, if there is uh, uh, our colleague with uh, affected themselves, like uh, the story uh, about Noma uh, previously, I I would be happy to to learn to listen from from them, to speak up themselves. Thank you, Marianne. Widya, thank you so much for um, organizing all these very complex uh, thoughts and approaches. Um, particularly the twin track that was really interesting and exciting, this kind of balance between empowerment on the one hand, but also can't be without mainstreaming. Um, that, that was great. And all those examples you gave us, including the, as you say, very exciting photo voice uh, a, a method that's gaining a lot of weight, uh, certainly for neglected tropical diseases, putting really the the means uh, of communication right in the hands of the communities. Uh, so that those have been really wonderful, very concrete examples of how to be more inclusive and mindful of disability and affected persons. So thank you, Widya. Um, thank you to all the speakers uh, as we, we come towards uh, the, the end of our, our session. Uh, you've 
totally uh, predictably generated quite a lot of comments and questions among our audience and uh, thank you to all who are tuned in for your very invaluable uh, comments and your questions and resources that you've been posted. Um, I suppose one of the questions that has come up uh, and just kind of taking it right from the beginning, what we heard from Elizabeth and perhaps I could invite Elizabeth and also Claire to, to come back and join us to uh, answer some of these questions. So we have here a, a really powerful comment by Anna J Jean. Hi, Anna, and thank you for, for your words. Um, you're talking in your comment about epistemic wrongs in research that lead to and exacerbate injustice. And you are fairly strikingly reminding us that global health and research reflect the system of power inherent in our societies. And so kind of building, uh, coming from that perspective and also uh, encompassing a question here from Martin Omedo. Uh, Martin says, there's been a lot of talk about decolonization, uh, and that is true, particularly decolonization of global health, uh, a huge conversation ongoing at the moment. Um, so despite a lot of talk, there has never been, it's never been really made clear what the practitioners and powers that be in the global south need to do. We always prescribe what the global north needs to do. And so perhaps just to sort of bring together all the things we've been talking about, uh, I'd like to ask our panelists their thoughts on um, moving forward uh, and thinking about all those things, whether it be in terms of the balance of power and those research inequalities between the global north and the global south, or quite simply within the world of illustration, of images, of um, film and representing affected communities. So how can we overcome equal partnerships? Um, or what further partnerships would you like to see in the future to help with your causes, your advocacy, your agendas. We heard from Chidiabere a very practical step, which is that he wants to see Google flooded with images of, you know, diverse medical images. He also wants to build a body of medical illustrators um, with a, you know, portraying and showing a range of very diverse ethnicities. Uh, so that was a practical step, but. Um, uh, I, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you can hear us. Um, I don't see your video, but I hope you're still with us. I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we yes. can hear you. Can you see my video? Not at the ah. moment. Ah, it was turned yeah. off. I see. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. You never know these days with the connections and whatnot. Yeah. Yes. Um, so perhaps since you very kindly opened the discussions mm -hmm. for us i might turn to you first just in a few words or just over a few minutes uh, what do you see mm -hmm. as what's needed to overcome these unequal partnerships mm -hmm. you've spoken a lot about the global north and the global south mm -hmm. I, I think these these are absolutely uh, very relevant questions and uh, and and really uh, point the way forward in terms of what we need to do and I'll start with the question about what uh, 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 practitioners in the global south need to do, because I agree that uh, the emphasis and in a sense, uh, Widya has has given us a very uh, important signposting of good practice in terms of empowering individuals that are disadvantaged and then the mainstreaming twin track approach as well. And this, uh, the, the, this, is, this same twin track approach is how we are dealing with issues on gender inequalities in terms of how we empower women, because we understand that women can't do it on their own. So you need that twin track of empowering women as well as challenging the mainstream of misogyny and patriarchy. And it's the same kind of twin track approach. We need practitioners in the global south to empower themselves through their networks. So for example, the, the, our network in African Gong has been very powerful in bringing together African practitioners 
in science communication to empower themselves to, to erase their visibility and knowledge in terms of what they're doing on the continent to capacity build, to have that solidarity to be able to overturn Eurocentric hegemony uh, in terms of their practice on the continent. And then parallel to that is then the, 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 the mainstreaming where you are engaging with, with, uh, with, with the uh, dominant partners in the global north to address issues of inequality. Because again, we accept that uh, uh, um, practitioners in the global south cannot do it on their own. And there are three ways that they need to engage to be able to address the, the mainstreaming issue. The first one is about advocacy with policymakers policymakers in the global south, how many of us engage with health policymakers in our countries, whether at national level or at sub-regional level? So engaging with policymakers in the global south and bringing them onto the battlefront in terms of uh, challenging those uh, power dynamics with global north uh, um, policymakers is very important. The second element is Every global South region has representatives at the level of global health governance structures, as I, as I talked about, WHO. Again, what advocacy, what agency do we drive with those representatives so that when they sit in these global governance uh, uh, mechanisms, that they actually address these issues of inequality are you with me? And, and, uh, uh, and lack of representation and lack of inclusion. And the third thing we need to do is to look at how we can mobilize resources as well within our regions to make sure that we find a way of reducing dependency on resourcing for these challenges in our regions from the global north. Uh, we keep talking about these issues as if the regions of the global south uh, do not have wealth and do not have resources. The, 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 the wealth is there, the resources are there. What we need to do as practitioners in these regions is to do a much better job of making sure that we carve up a piece of that uh, pie, are you with me, in terms of these issues. So yes, there's a lot that we can do with this twin track approach of empowering and, uh, uh, and asserting uh, um, practitioners and researchers from the global south within themselves. But also the mainstreaming parallel action is very, very important. And the two need to go together for us to see any kind of structural and sustainable change. So thanks to Widya for reminding us of good practices that we have used in other fields uh, and how they can transfer to this very same issue that we're talking about. And thank you to you, Elizabeth, for taking those things we've spoken about and really putting the energy behind it to remind us that this really needs to go to the advocacy level, not at the highest level, really. Um, not just in particular diseases or at a local level, but this is really a global movement that is needed. And it's wonderful to have um, sort of very determined and energetic advocates as yourself. So thank you for that. Um, so mm -hmm. I kind of touched upon Chidi Bear's um, suggestions. And so I'll jump straight over to you, Claire. Claire, in terms of partnerships, I think you've been amazing. You've seen a lot of them. You've been very creative mm -hmm. as a filmmaker mm -hmm. engaged in NOMA. Then as a Médecins Sans Frontières campaign manager, you've worked with, on the creative side, you've worked with health ministries and also NGOs, mm -hmm. the patients themselves. I mean, you know partnership and you know that this is how you have boosted NOMA along with a wonderful team of advocates up the um, advocacy agenda. So. You've done a lot. What would you like to see more of moving forward? Thank you, uh, Marianne, and, and thank you, Elizabeth, for, for this inspiring uh, reply and, and um, uh, really contributing to, to these debates. Um, 
I mean, from my perspective, uh, and, and also reflecting on what was said before, I, I would say that at a point where we are trying to show that NOMA is not only an African disease or a disease affecting um, a specific region, but that this is a global issue that needs a, a global uh, response, uh, I would like to see images uh, showing uh, patients from all over the world. Um, they have been hiding. Uh, we, we know that there are cases. Uh, you, you have to dig. Uh, uh, Joanna was sharing uh, um, the, a link uh, in the chat to, to a medical uh, library. And uh, um, I have been also looking for images of, of NOMA in, in many, many uh, online database and, and finding sometimes some, some pictures or drawings. But I think this is the ones I would like to, to see on, on Google. So we have a clearer picture of, of uh, this disease, of the fact that it has been affecting uh, people worldwide uh, since, since uh, forever. I mean, since the antiquity, uh, through history. And, and this can make a change because already, I mean, we see a, a, a joint community, I think, from, from the global south and global north, uh, joining efforts to, to um, raise awareness. But we also need to understand that this is not a disease affecting only a, a specific uh, region. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, also thank you for mentioning uh, Joanna Butler. Joanna's doing a PhD at the University of Surrey, working on a set of medical um, or healthcare illustrations on NTDs aimed specifically at healthcare workers in Ghana. So we'll be uh, watching this space very carefully. Thank you, Joanna. Perhaps we can have you on the festival sometime next year when, when your work um, is, uh, is furthered. And uh, one thing that was quite uh, interesting about the resource that you've mentioned, Claire, and that Joanna posted about these medical images, um, there is a cost associated. I am not uh, in any way saying the cost is not warranted. Of course, uh, artists need remuneration. But I do think, and perhaps this is a talk for a different kind of session or a different time, but there is certainly lots of different kind of barriers to suitable, dignified, um, equitable, relevant almost images. Um, anecdotally, we see that at the ISNTD, as you know, uh, the images of neglected tropical diseases are, are few and far between, and the ones we do like can sometimes cost 200 pounds an image, uh, which, you know, is not impossible, but it's not really <laughs> realistic for an organization of our size so if we're looking to illustrate you know i was looking to illustrate doctors or healthcare in jamaica and my choice was to have a gentleman clearly an actor dressed in a lab coat holding a syringe <laughs> yeah. full yeah. of pills which is ridiculous um anyway yeah. that was an aside but i think uh, you know really emphasizing how access to these images and is will be a huge barrier yes claire no th this is indeed a very interesting topic i'm also super passionate about this one i think it's very important to share knowledge so i mean we can obviously do, plan another session for this uh, but the question of indeed i mean the, the copyright and and how to find images that are available and and this is just a, a small uh, thing that i want to add that we have make sure uh, to have all illustration done by chloe available under um a creative commons um license uh, so these are available and we are also providing all pictures for free um a, a certain number of them so of course i mean as creative uh, artists we need to live and we are making a living out of the images and we, there are some, some laws to protect our rights and, and there are very specific rules about not cropping pictures, not altering them, also to respect the integrity of patients. Uh, but, but it's also possible to find uh, uh, an in-between and, and solution for this. And this is something we have also uh, put a lot of thoughts uh, in. So very, very happy to provide either picture or illustration of NOMA if you ever need some. Thank you. 
This is wonderful. And so perhaps I'll just turn to Widya for some final comments. Um, again, what would you like to see more of, uh, whether it be your perspective from a leprosy advocate point of view, disability inclusion, but also um, as someone working from Indonesia? Yes, uh, I think yes, uh, partnership is very important here as, as this is also our approach as uh, organization. Uh, we, we work uh, uh, together with, uh, with the person uh, affected by leprosy, uh, whether uh, especially in a group, uh, in the networks. And, and and also with the government, of course, and uh, the, with the professional association. We work, uh, for example, with Dermatologist Association uh, in terms of to, to, to bring uh, 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 the right information and knowledge about uh, a person affected by leprosy, about the leprosy disease to the public. That's very important. So we, we involve, uh, um, uh, we invite the professional to telling themselves what the situation uh, uh, happened uh, about uh, the policy. And also the, the media, this is very important. Uh, what we do uh, uh, regularly also to have meeting with media, whether public media or social media, the bloggers. Again, I, I tell, I'm telling you about the uh, the the, uh, the collaboration with the bloggers uh, to tell them what the the right language, what the right terminology about person affected by leprosy, and ask the person affected to tell them what they feel, what they want to have photo. In, in in media what they don't like uh, to be uh, uh, exposed on there uh, and uh, for the filmmakers so that's that's uh, uh, what they needed and, and on behalf of person uh, affected also uh, we in we also infer we in also invite the family the family members because they are the one uh, uh, dealing for day to day having person affected in their family it's yeah. not easy situation. So uh, we want them to, to voice also uh, in this uh, uh, um, uh, movement. So uh, this is, I think, what, what is important on, on the partnership. So we involve everyone here uh, together. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a really important point about engaging the wider support network of affected persons. Um, you're right, uh, a neglected tropical disease or any disability or health and so that's really important to include them in the messaging in the initiatives. So that's so wonderful. Uh, just before we wrap up, I just wanted to flag also a comment here made by Ali Mayehu Kasahum. And hello, Ali Mayehu, thanks for joining us. Something that I had not thought about, but that's uh, equally on the access to images or access to resources um you're mentioning quite rightly that so we do put our videos on in in our case we've chosen youtube and you're mentioning here the problem of certain um uh, countries or jurisdictions restricting access to certain content um, so that is definitely to be continued. I'll be in touch about that. <laughs> and, uh, and so maybe for the future, we can have such a, a, a panel uh, looking at access uh, to materials. Uh, so thank you very much. That's a really great outcome of this discussion. In addition to the huge amount of uh, perspectives and also really important considerations to think about when making creative materials around neglected tropical diseases, but also just health in a more general sense. Um, it's been really thought provoking. I wanna thank all of the participants, of course our speakers, but also this very engaged audience with uh, really practical solutions and comments. So thank you to everyone. It's been really wonderful. Thank you, thank you. Or exchange all our uh, ideas and uh, to be continued definitely yeah thank you
Bye now. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.